Welcome and thank you for joining. For those of you who've been following Access Pay, you'll be aware that over recent weeks have been highlighting the up and coming changes around ISO 20022. Our aim is to create awareness around these changes, the impacts that these will have on you and your businesses, as well as the actions you can be doing to prepare yourselves. Interestingly, we know that the recent financial trends report that 52% of respondents are yet to make any preparations. So I'm delighted that we have two industry experts with us today who are going to be able to share more details around the changes, as well as thoughts on what you can be doing in advance to prepare yourselves. So let me hand over to Anish and Tanvir who can introduce themselves. So Anish, you first, maybe? So hi everyone, my name's uh, Anish Kapoor. I, uh, I run Access Pay and, um, and have been heavily involved in all things ISO 20022 for the last uh, six or seven years. Hi everyone, I'm Tanvir yeah, Bharti. I'm, I'm, I'm the Lead Policy Analyst in the CHAPS Standards Team leading on ISO 20022 Enhanced Data at the Bank of England. Okay, guys, so should we just get into it then? So firstly, should we understand some of the fundamentals of ISO 20022? So maybe, Nish, we can, you can begin and let's explain the benefits from the bank's perspective, please. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I guess always good to sort of, um, you know, try and explain the, the, the why, you know, why is all this happening? What, 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 why are we doing this? So, um, and there's, there's, there's two big drivers. Um, one of them is around sort of financial crime and compliance. So, you know, as you, as you can imagine, um, um, the financial system uh, is, is you know, we think of it as, as moving money for ourselves. Also, it can be used to move money for, um, you know, nefarious purposes, you know, and 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 um, and that's why sometimes payments, you know, get stopped or held up or, 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 or you know, a bank might phone you up and ask you for more data and, it's because there's a whole set of, of checks that have to be performed and there's a lot of regulation around that uh, that the banks and, and have to comply with. So, so one part of this is about trying to put as much of that data as we can into the payment message to just make it easier for everyone in the chain so that, so that actually things flow smoothly from, from end to end. Um, but the second part is actually about just the benefits that, that accrue to everyone in the ecosystem if you have more data in the payment message. And the best way I can explain that is, you know, if you look at your own personal banking app, you know, it, it, you know whenever you go into a shop and spend some money, it pops up on the screen. It says, oh, you just spent this money in on coffee or on, on shopping or on, on whatever, right? And then it has some very clever budgeting things that look at that data to say, oh, you're spending too much money on coffee or too much money on shopping or whatever. And, um, and it can do all that because actually there's a, there's a lot of data added added added, added, added to those to the payment messages and but we don't have that um, on on sort of non card payments and that's the other massive massive you know um, um, benefit and, and sort of driver of, of why this is happening. Thanks, Anish. Tanvir, anything you want to add on that at all? Absolutely. So I think Tanish is absolutely right in terms of the large drivers from a regulatory perspective and the fact that ISO 20022 can carry so much more data. What I'd add as well to that point is that it, the data in ISO 20022 is also more structured. So the payment industry in the account to account space that Anish mentioned, which when you're thinking about that, think of your mobile payments to your friends rather than your card payments. So if you've ever tried to send a payment remittance, then the actual reason for your payment, you'll know that it's only 18 characters. You may not even be able to fit in everything you wanted to say. So that's Anish's point about more data. But what's really interesting in the account to account space and the benefits that Anish mentioned around financial crime and compliance is the fact that the data is also more structured. So the payment industry with the old payment standard has developed lots of codes, for example, using slashes to put certain information in certain parts of the payment. ISO 20022 is so much more structured. So think of this as a web form you might have for your online payments where it's not just put your whole address in one box, it's got separate lines for all, all of your address lines. Um, so financial crime compliance is a key one. We've we've consulted with an industry over the last few years around what, what are the benefits um, in chaps in particular, the, the, the wholesale um, payment system in the UK. So this is used for financial institution payments, large flows in the city of London, but also for you and I when it comes to house payments, etc. Those those payments that 
that need to happen on the same day. Financial crime and compliance was a key, key theme that was coming up. Anish also mentioned more data that can be used for things like innovation, market intelligence. Um, there's a whole range of benefits for the entire payment ecosystem. And indeed, we, we may not know just yet what the benefits may be. Once that innovation comes in through firms like Access Pay and others in the market, um, ISO 20022, it's richer data, it's more structured data, could could invent new use cases um, in the coming years. So how much is this a shift from where we are at the moment to where it's going to in the banking landscape? Yeah, I, I mean, um, maybe I can pick that one up. And, and yeah, it's 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 a big shift because of what, what Tambay just mentioned about the structure point. Um, and we're going from a world where, um, you know, if data has been added to these messages, um, it's really being kind of up to the um, individuals adding that data and receiving that data, how they go about doing that. So, so, um, so you know, to, to Tanvir's point, you, you, you sometimes get, um, you know, one organisation might have an address which is just, it's just literally one long line of, a, 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 of an address and you just have to, whoever's receiving it has to recognize that the first, I don't know, 15 characters might be the street name and the next two might be the, you know, the, the number, you know, and, and, and uh, where someone else might put slashes in, someone else might put, um, you know, um, other symbols in. So, so there's, there's, it, it, there's kind of no standardization today at all. And so if you think about moving, moving from no standardization to standardization, so that, that is a really, really, really big shift. Okay. And is this just chaps faster payments, or is this now being extended? Maybe Tanvir, he can help with that one. It's a really good question. So it's live in chaps as of June 2023. So the new standard is available, and it's up to banks how they're rolling that out to their customers. Um, it, we are hoping to also add it to BACs and uh, faster payments in the UK, which are the retail payment systems. These are operated by an independent firm called Pay UK. It's in their pipeline, um, but it's got tied up in wider prioritisation work around the national payments vision and what was previously called um, the new payments architecture. But the general direction of the industry is towards using ISO 20022 and it's a global change so almost half of chaps payments have a cross-border leg so it's very important for chaps in particular to be harmonized globally so for example um, europe has already moved the the cross-border uh, payments and reporting plus network which is the swift cross-border payments network has already moved on to iso 2022 and by november 2025 key jurisdictions such as the united states will also have moved to iso 2022 so there's some really exciting um, opportunities in the cross-border space for harmonization not just domestically but also so international. And what kind of timelines are we thinking of for all of these changes? So by November 2025 is the end of what SWIFT called the coexistence period. So that means where ISO 20022 is live on some systems like Europe, cross-border and the UK. But the old MT messaging standard is still available, for example, for some of the late movers such as the United States. But by the end of November 2025, the high value payment systems will have, will have migrated. The, the retail picture is a bit more uh, nuanced and it depends on domestic priorities. So at the moment, I don't think we have a timeline from Pay UK, but it will be in the years to come. ISO is definitely on the radar. Okay, great. Um, and then, I guess, regarding any wider industry changes that may be happening, new payments architecture, etc., um, do they need to align to ISO 20022? So, what are the thoughts there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Sorry, I'm sure. So, you can. No, go on, Sandra, after you. <laughs> I was just going to reiterate that, yes, it's definitely in the radar. So there's been some work to, to consider the scope of the new payments architecture and retail payments in the UK moving forward with the Treasury driven national payments division. Um, so they're looking at how exactly that could be delivered. But I think ISO 20022 has always been the minimum viable product. So having that harmonization and interoperability domestically is absolutely key. It's sometimes described as, if you think of ISO as a, as a language, it's bringing payments into the 21st century. So if you think about everything Anish was saying about financial crime and having more data, we've already got data flowing seamlessly in other parts of our lives. And it's about bringing that into payments as well. Sorry, Anish. No, I think you've summarised it really well, and and um, and yeah, certainly from from all our discussions with with Pay UK, um, you know, I, I say twenty oh two two is is definitely top of mind for them in terms of um, direction of travel and and kind of watch this space really for um, you know for, for kind of more announcements I think from them in terms of 
uh, in terms of how we're going to move from where we are today to to using that standard. Great. So, so thanks, Ben. So I guess we've looked at kind of the fundamentals of it, but obviously it's now about helping people to prepare for the changes that are coming. So maybe this one for you, Anish. So what steps and processes do you think are involved to get people compliant and actually the timelines and what they need to do and when? Yeah, so we, we, we tend to see that um, this, kind of, this kind of four big things that sort of organisations have to do. So um, the, the, the first one is around um, uh, you know, just simply getting the data that, 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 that they need um, to, to, to kind of populate these new message formats. Um, the second piece is well, where are you going to store that data because it needs to go it needs to be stored somewhere the the, the third element is um you have to think about how you are then going to add that data to the various payment instructions you are making both you know obviously high value today but then um, also think about low value as, we, as we've just touched on um and then the fourth component which sometimes gets missed um is You've also got to think about the fact that the data that's going to be coming into you is also going to be uh, is, is, is going to transform and, 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 and you know, from um, you know, relatively basic sort of, you know, 16, 18 character reference data like Tamla was talking about to, to suddenly very, a very rich set of data. So, so that fourth point was, is really about considering, uh, you know, how are you going to deal with this different format and, 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 and much richer format of data com coming into your systems? Yeah. Tambir, anything you'd like to add on to that at all? No, I think Anish is absolutely right. I just reiterate that fourth point, so being ready for how it's coming in. So I described it as a new language. So what that means on a practical level is you've got new fields, there are new mappings from what may have gone in the old payment standard. It will now land in a different space when it comes in. So what we saw with the CHAPS community, and massive thanks to all of the CHAPS banks for being ready in time for June 2023, was extended testing in order to make sure that those payments were landing safely. None of that data was getting lost when those tax payments were coming in and that they were being processed successfully. So it, it, it's a massive change, going back to one of your earlier questions, Fiona, um, around you know how, how big a change is this. I think the languages we were using previously were from the mid-90s. So it, it's been a massive change for the industry. I'm uh, really proud that it's gone ahead in chats, and I think there are some really exciting opportunities for the future. Yeah. So I guess if I'm listening to this and going, right, all these changes are coming, that sounds a lot, because what we just talked about, those four key points. So what would your advice be around the first deadlines coming, the, I guess the most urgent steps to be taken now to help you on this journey? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's really about just working through those those those, those four steps in order. And, and, and in order to do that, you, um, you you've got to be having conversations with with your bank or banks uh, about um, about what their requirements are uh, going to be for this and, and how their systems are, um, are, are going to handle this data. Um, you uh, also need to be having internal discussions. You, you might have a variety of internal systems owned by different you know parts of the organisation. So. You need to understand well what are those systems capable of. Um, uh, you know, are, are, are they going to be able to um, um, add this 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 enhanced data in? Are they able to store this data? Um, and then and then and then the, the the other component part is then you know talking to um, you know vendors, partners, um, uh, uh, you know in the market to sort of help address any gaps. So, you know, so, so as you're having those two, two conversations, you'll start to see, oh, okay, we need to supplement our systems here, or we, or we need to transport, transform data to, to make it work with the bank over here. You'll also see how those things change over time, because again, what we're seeing is that there's, there's a bit of a moving target here, so that you know, bank systems will evolve over time, your own back office systems will evolve over time. Um, so you'll build up a bit of a, a roadmap of, of of how you need to deal with all of the you know the, the, the data requirements and the transformations and everything that's needed, and some of that you're able to do natively. Some of it you, you'll need to work with partners to do. So, so so you kind of need to have all those three people in the mix. And my you know I suppose my one piece of advice is start now. Yeah, start now. So 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 you know do not wait. Um, 
we um, what whilst the deadlines might be let's say you know end, you know November twenty five for the you know coexistence period ending and, and May twenty five for the um, if you like for the enforcement of 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 of, of the first um, um, uh, set, set of rules around you know chaps payments. Really, you you, sh you should be making those changes now. You know, you should be thinking of making those changes now and getting ready now and testing it now. Um, so, so yeah, I think I think that that would be my, my my key message. Yeah, and and I think it's interesting you mentioned kind of banks there. So again, can we give any advice on what specific information maybe we should be asking the banks to help with this and also some of the beneficiaries? Yep, um, and you want to take that one? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to kick off with that one. Um, so in terms of um, banks, the, 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 question, the question really is, well, um, what, what, uh, where exactly would you like us to put this extra data? Um, because the, the, the banks actually have, qu have qu quite a degree of flexibility on, 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 on how, how they can do that. Um, so, um, so yeah, the, uh, the, the idea would, yeah, yeah. So it's very important to speak to your banks about that to understand it, it, it kind of it, 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 exactly where they'd like you to put the data. And like I said, that, that will likely change over time. So the message we're getting is there might be what, uh, um, one answer to that question today, but in 18 months time, the way that looks might be different. And, and that's simply just a function of the uh, bank's own systems maturing uh, and developing. And as, as Tanvir pointed out, there's there's a lot of change going on in the global marketplace. And so their the internal systems are not just dealing with this; they're dealing they're dealing with you know, with all of that as well. So that, that's why there's there's uh, you'll see these changes rolled out in in, in sort of a bit of a timeline. Um, and then in terms of beneficiaries. Um, it's really things like uh, legal entity identifiers, if, if they have them, you know, c c c you know, you, you kind of need that data from them. Structured addresses, or, or let me phrase that another way, you you want to make sure you've got all the elements of their address um, so that you can actually populate a, a, stru a structured address uh, field correctly. Um, and um, uh, and uh, yeah, so they're, they're probably the, 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 the two the probably the two main things that you need from uh, from your beneficiaries yeah Tambir anything to add to that yes okay. sorry Fiona I was just going to return to your previous question as well so Anish spoke a little bit about May 2025 rules so in chaps when we initially consulted on migrating to the ISO 20022 standard a key theme that was coming back from the industry was that because it is such a large project and does require such large budgets they were keen to see the benefits from it as well so rather than just doing a simple like for like mapping of what they had previously it was to use these exciting new enhanced data fields to add real value to the payment message so Anish mentioned legal entity identifiers so this is a, a global identifier that businesses can use particularly financially financial institutions um, in identifying themselves across borders rather than being a domestic registration number that's one of the things that we heard from industry the bank of england we heard that it would be useful to mandate it in chaps for financial institution payments because those financial institutions will already have leis for things like derivatives reporting in the eu and in uk regulations uh, in order to drive that uptake to start seeing it used in the payment messages so leis was one and the other one that's coming in in may 2025 are purpose codes so we spoke a little bit about card payments earlier the way those apps do that clever budgeting um, is by using something called merchant category codes we, we haven't quite had something like that in the account to account space purpose codes offers a really exciting standardized global way of doing that so there are lots of resources on the bank of england's website that we can link at the end of the webinar that I think the first step for you, if you're an end user, would be you may already be aware of all of these terms and the new enhanced data fields. But if you're not, have a look. There are links there to the international purpose code list. Um, have a look, see how the purpose codes map to your current payments. Would it be useful for you to use them? How many would you need to use? You may only need to use a subset. Have a look at legal entity identifiers. Are they relevant for not only you as a business, but also your suppliers? Um, there's so much pressure on businesses right now from regulations, but also generally for financial transparency to know who your customer is, who your supply chain is. The LEI offers a really exciting, globally standardized way of, of requiring that and storing that information. And then, as Anish says, 
have a look at your end-to-end -end field. So have you got vendors involved in your payments journey? What are your internal customer databases like? How do you start to integrate that new information such that you can populate it really easily in your payments moving forward? And just the final piece, um, Anish mentioned structured addresses. So this has a slightly longer timeline to it. So although structured addresses are live in, in Chaps payments, if you'd like to use them, um, they don't start to become mandatory until November 2025, at which point you have, you have a hybrid address, which is basically you use some structured lines, but you still have a box to capture anything else, any of those nuances that Anish mentioned that different people have different addresses and different address formats. But then from November 2026 in the wholesale space across the world, fully unstructured addresses will start to be rejected. So what that means is you can't chuck the whole address into just one box. You do need to start having, for example, town name and country specifically mapped out. So that gives you a kind of hook from November 2026 to work backwards and start to make sure that your database is updated and your banking provider's databases are updated. I guess just one final question then linked to that. So what's the consequence of me not being compliant? So, so what question. could I expect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good question, Fiona. So in CHAPS, the, the May 2025 rules are um, going to be monitored and followed up by assurance. So they won't be rejecting any payments. So even from May 2025 onwards, if you don't have an LEI or a purpose code, it's not as if your payment will be rejected, but your banking supplier will be monitored by the CHAPS payment system operator, who's the Bank of England, to see how many purpose codes and LEIs they're using, and we'll follow up where we see any non-compliances. And hopefully banks will continue to talk with their end users around how how they can make sure that they're getting that enhanced data. By contrast, the, the structured address changes that are coming in, in in the wholesale space from November 2026 onwards, that is validation, that's hard rejection. So if you were to send a chat's payment with only an unstructured address from November 2026 onwards, I'm afraid it just would not pass validation. So you, you'd get a rejection message and you'd have to resubmit that with at least the town name and country structured out. Yeah. So, which just shows the importance of actually doing this and being compliant. Um, so, thanks both. So, one of the, uh, I was going to ask about what resources are out there, because clearly there are a lot of changes, critical, as you've just said, from a certain date, you know, payments will be rejected if not compliant. So, thanks for picking that up, and we will add some resources to the end of the webinar as well. So, thank you both. So, just before we finish, is there anything else either of you would like to add? No, uh, I think for me, it, it's um, I'll just reiterate the, you know, to not put this off, basically. And, and you know, we talk about May 25, November 25, November 26. And there is, um, you, you know, it, it's easy to think, oh, it's, it's a lot, you know, it's a long way away. I, I don't have to do anything. Um, you know, you, you got to remember that there's a number of parties you need to bring together. Um uh, I, I think Tanvir talked about, you know, sort of you know, testing windows with, 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 with you know, as, 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 as Bank of England rolled this out amongst the CHAPS participants. So you've got to remember testing, you have to test these things um, and you need test windows with, with you know, your banking partners, um, probably test windows with your own internal, you know, from your own internal systems and, and certainly with your vendors and other partners as well. So, so hence why it's so, so important to start these things now and get ahead of the curve and, and and just get these things done because they do have to get done so um better do it now be in control of it um rather than try and rush these things through in a year's time when you may really struggle to get the time that you need from your banks and your partners and others yeah and it will come around very quickly as well as we know Right, so thank you Anish Tanvir for your knowledge and expertise and thank you everybody for joining. Have a great day.